Hello, um, and thank you very much for joining Nikkei Asia's special webinar today. My name is Akito Tanaka, and I'm a senior staff writer for Nikkei and a chief business news correspond correspondent for Nikkei Asia. Um, today, we would like to dis discuss um, one of the hottest uh, business topic, or maybe we should say a uh, coolest business topic in, in perspective of global warming. Um, and the topic is the road to sustainability and the future of EV. Uh, particularly, we'll focus about um, the new emerging trend in the, in the EV market. And uh, we have a very special guest uh, today, Mr. Takaki Nakanishi and Mr. Lei Tso. Um, Mr. Nakanishi is the analyst and the chief executive officer of Nakanishi Research Institute. Um, Nakanishi-san is an expert in the global automobile industry. Uh, he has been covering uh, the industry since 1990s, I believe. Um, he is the best uh, analyst um, based in Tokyo, and he's a regular commentator for Nikkei and Nikkei Asia. And Mr. Lei Tso, uh, he is the partner for Deloitte Thomas Consulting. Uh, he is a 20-year veteran in the management consulting, um, and he has worked with corporate executives across a wide range of industries. Um, and he has extensive uh, knowledge and is an expert in EVs and with a very, very deep um, knowledge, especially in the, in the Chinese market, which is very, very important in the, in the EV industry. Um, now, uh, we would like to start, if that's okay. Um, I think it's okay. All right. Yes, please. Thank uh, you very much for the yeah, Thank you very much, Nakanishi-san. Thank you very much, so san Great. Yeah. So um, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Nakanishi-san a few questions. And uh, Nakanishi-san has kindly prepared us a slide for this question. So if you could uh, turn on the uh, Nakanishi-san slide, please, uh, Rabat. Thank you very much. And I'll ask two questions. Um, and so you could answer both two uh, with your slides, please, Nakanishi-san. Um, the first is, um, what is uh, Nakanishi Research Institute's uh, latest uh, global market projections on hybrid vehicles, electronic vehicles, and FCV, fuel cell vehicle, vehicles? And then the other one, um, a very important thing is that, uh, how do you assess government emissions regulations in, in major automobile market? And most importantly, uh, are these uh, regulations realistic? Nakanishi-san to you. Okay, thank you very much for questions, uh, Mr. Tanaka. Uh, I think uh, situation is uh, actually moving fast, uh, but at this point, I estimate uh, battery EV percentage in a global sales by 2030 would be more than 20%, uh, specifically 21%. And also plug-in hybrid uh, count for 10% of the global sales. So approximately uh, 30% of the vehicle new car sales uh, will be e-mobility, uh, which is based on main power uh, from electric electricity. Uh, as for hybrid, uh, there are some debates, but uh, I still believe hybrid sales continue to grow. And uh, by 2030, which account for 36% uh, for global sales, including strong hybrid system like a Toyota hybrid system and also a European led mild hybrid system. But important things to understand here, uh, uh, percentage of uh, BEV penetration really vary, change, varies by region to region, especially in Europe, uh, percentage will exceed 50% and maybe followed by US approaching to 30 to 35%. But uh, percentage in Japan, Asia, uh, probably stay very low. Uh, that's, you know, percentage of baby penetration depends on uh, basically you know, government policies, regulations, and also most importantly, uh, availability of uh, clean energy mix. Yeah. So uh, uh, that's uh, one thing that, you know, I'd like to highlight. And number right. two, a uh, uh, border between battery EV and a plug-in hybrid Actually, that's also uh, depend on government regulations and also availability of clean energy. And uh, probably at this point, uh, most of the developed market like uh, Europe and the US, a percentage of battery will be higher than plug-in hybrid, but a uh, plug-in hybrid probably stay important role in the markets like uh, Japan and also uh, Asia. Mm. That's what I think. Great. Uh, and a uh, 2035 still, 
that's quite quite a big question mark. But uh, definitely, uh, this is going to be a re irreversible trend. Mm -hmm. uh, going to be higher penetration of a battery EV. Uh, by 2035 in order to achieve uh, uh, getting close to the goal of uh, carbon neutrality. Okay, so that's an uh, answer to your first question. And uh, let's you. move on to uh, my uh, uh, answer to your second question in you know, a policy by uh, each regions. Uh, please go to slide number two. Uh, this describe a situation for uh, the US. Please you know, move to the, yes, that's right, thank you. And um, uh, uh, US regulation consists of the three important pillars. Number one, energy mix. They are trying to go into be zero emission uh, for uh, a faster generation of electricity by 2035. So uh, uh, energy mix uh, will be zero emission by 2035, which mean uh, tail, uh, tail pipe emission is a very important issue uh, to reduce uh, uh, carbon uh, emission in this you know, transportation sector. So uh, uh, after collapse of the Trump administration, new Biden uh, uh, administration is demonstrating uh, strengthening GHG policy and also a California-led ZEB policy also be more effective. So uh, uh, I think last uh, uh, July, uh, Biden has uh, uh, released uh, executive order uh, which will uh, strengthen GHG policy uh, and also, uh, uh, they try to achieve, uh, you know, uh, more, you know, uh, the, the, the waiver of California states will uh, be maintained. Mm. So um, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, they are targeting approximately 40 to 50 percent zero emission vehicle by 2030. And many OEMs are welcome uh, that, you know, decision. But U.S. will need to spend a lot of infrastructure preparation. At the same time, uh, they also need to spend a lot of subsidies. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think a target of 40% is a very ambitious, uh, but uh, I think uh, this will be the you know, uh, strength of the policy and are maintained uh, by uh, US administration. Okay, and I, I think uh, coming uh, into uh, uh, the, the interim election uh, is a very important you know, a judgment. Uh, this policy can be sustainable or not. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, and on next slide, page three, that's describe the European situation. And uh, definitely, uh, this is a European uh, uh, regional strategy to strengthen the uh, industries, especially mm -hmm. after uh, a COVID-19 situation. I think uh, 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 EU Green Deal uh, bias to more strengthening industries rather than environmental policy. Mm -hmm. They really need to strengthen the economy and uh, industries. So energy strategy and also industry strengthening has combined, it's, a, you know, it's coupled together. And um, uh, uh, this will be accelerated with a huge amount of uh, a budget, like uh, NE, NGEU, uh, which is totaling 750 billion euro. And uh, last month, uh, uh, EU has announced uh, FIT 455, uh, a new regulation plan, as expected, uh, there are a strengthening reduction of uh, uh, CO2 emission by 55%, more specifically, you know, CO2 emission by 48 gram per kilometer, and also uh, uh, introduction, maybe, uh, uh, it's a, which is a virtually zero emission vehicle by 2035. That's very ambitious target. And also uh, implementation of uh, uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism uh, uh, by 2023. I think uh, Europe will definitely uh, uh, progress a high pace of uh, uh, zero emission vehicle penetrations. Mm. Okay. And uh, I think that's achievable, uh, much more than realistic than the US. And uh, please move to the next slide, page four. This situation described the Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, Japan has announced a green, deal, a green growth strategy uh, in June. And uh, uh, according to this, uh, passengers will be 100% electrified, including hybrid by uh, 2035. And a commercial vehicle will be electrified by 2040. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and if that including, uh, 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 if you will, uh, carbon neutral, uh, uh, if you will, uh, uh, best uh, high technology still. Uh, Japan is uh, targeting zero emission for new car sales by 2040, and uh, eventually all vehicles on the road by 2050, uh, uh, which is about five to 10 years behind from Europe and the US. 
Uh, but that's kind of a realistic target because Japan has a huge limitation for clean energy mix availability. So um, uh, uh, that is a, a situation. And in Japan, big question mark is how government will uh, uh, control a 2030 fuel efficient target, which determined in 2019. The Suga administration has already committed, uh, revised the up target of GHG reduction by 44% by 2030. Uh, this 25 four kilometer per liter, is that good enough to achieve that GHG regulation? I think, you know, based on 25, 25.4 kilometer, Japan penetration over zero emission may be limited up to 20%. But if government decide to increase this regulation, zero emission percentage naturally have to go up. Mm -hmm. So Japan uh, policy has not clarified yet, but uh, uh, at this point, I do not expect any significant change in uh, 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 fuel efficiency regulation. So uh, Japan is a probably, probably progressing something like a Galapagos Island-like you know, evolution compared to US and Europe. That difference is really caused by availability of uh, clean energy mix. Okay, and uh, uh, next slide, uh, page five, I simply just uh, add this slide to explain uh, uh, how long a hybrid uh, technology can survive. Uh, clearly, UK and uh, France, those kind of uh, uh, EU countries uh, are going to be uh, uh, you know, difficult to survive by 2035. But uh, Japan, China, and uh, other parts of the world, including Asia, a hybrid technology probably stay in uh, effective uh, 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 technologies in order to reduce carbon emission from transportation sector and approaching to carbon neutrality by 2050. Well, kind of long answer, but uh, that's what I think. Great, thank you so much. Very detailed, it's, it's really good, thank you. Um, now, Tosan, um, we'd like to discuss a little bit broader sense. Um, the, the concept of EV and electrification, this is not new, it's been around for a while. Um, in, in fact, Nissan Leaf, one of the mass produced EVs, they were introduced um, back in 2010, which is almost 10, I mean, more than 10 years ago, actually. Yeah. So what do you think is the difference here right now? Um, what's, the, what's the new trend in, uh, compared from the last decade? And how, how do you think this electrification will evolve in, in the new, near future? And then again, Tosan has uh, prepared us a slide. So if you could show uh, Tosan's slide, please. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, wait, thank you. This is it. Can you move to the next slide? Yeah, okay. yeah and the next. Wait, wait. Thank you, Akito-san. Really, it's my honor to be here. That's a great question. About 10 years ago, I published, uh, let, let me uh, see the left side. I published a book on the latest trends and market entry strategy for next generation automobile in China. As a coincidence, the publisher for my book was Nikkei BP. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's also is a sister company of Nikkei. It was mainly about new energy vehicles, policy trends, market potential, and also analysis on major players. Mm. At the time, EV was just an alternative to traditional gasoline vehicles as called the ICV, utilizing electrified powertrain, battery, motor, and inverter were three of the most important components for an EV. At that time, I still remember in Japanese we call Sanshu Jinki. Mm, if, we, yeah, if we look at the right side of the slide, Fast forwarding to today, the development for EV has greatly exceeded my expectation, actually, since the definition of EV is quickly evolving and expanding. Due to its energy storage niche, EV has become a part of the energy distribution system. As we know, most of lower taxes and future mobilities are being developed and tested on EV, as you will see on the next page. As a key element of intelligent mobility. EV should be connected and smart and to interact with cutting edge technology like AI, cloud computing, and 5G. So thus, the concept of EV nowadays is a mix of energy, transportation, and the ICT. So can we move to the next slide? Yeah. So this slide, you, 10 years ago, 
really that's it's a new new mobility also they are electrified by uh, ev i couldn't even at that time now i couldn't have imagined that ev could be developed in so many areas for mass vehicle we can see low speed shuttle and lower taxi with high speed of over uh, 60 kilometers per hour for flight vehicles the commercialization of battery powered indoor delivery robot and the last mile delivery robot can be found in major markets such as US and China during the pandemic these delivery robots are playing very important role and are widely used for carrying goods in various areas such as in hospital and the restaurants or in the community areas so these robot makers are also made from US and China also industrial vehicles and the micro mobility such as ev tower and scooters are being electrified so these photos were all taken by myself when i attended events all over the world when international travel was still possible so as you can see in the 10 years time mobility has been evolving and so he has a power source for the mobility. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, and it will be definitely interesting to see what's going to happen from here uh, in 10 years time. Right, right. Thank you. Now, uh, let's switch back to um, Nakanishi-san. Um, and this is, I think this is the best question for you since you specialize in these questions. And the question is, um, when you look at the major OEMs, and, and when we say OEM, it means automaker like Toyota and Honda and uh, Volkswagen in case people in the audience didn't know this. So if you look at OEM, which OEM is sort of advancing the most in this new regulation electrification and which one is lagging? Uh, how, what do you say? And if you could switch back to um, Nakanishi-san's slide. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's move to page uh, six, and uh, this describes the uh, ZEB target uh, released by Japanese OEMs, mm. and um, uh, starting from Toyota about 20, and uh, Honda, you know, for developed market, 40%, globally about 30%. Well, actually, we knew a trend of uh, carbon neutrality arrive and a tougher regulation on tailpipe CO2 emissions. Uh, that we knew since 2015, when the Paris Accord uh, made on a COP21. Mm. But uh, this trend significantly accelerated after 2020. I think uh, uh, a trigger was a collapse of uh, Trump administration that created a huge dam uh, to stop the trend for the carbon neutrality, but that is collapsed. So since 2020, you know, uh, major OEMs has been uh, uh, resetting their strategies, uh, products, technologies, and uh, they are releasing their specific plans. And uh, in my view, there are no huge differences. Uh, for instance, Japan, uh, uh, their total percentage to global market looks low, but uh, that's largely because of uh, their sales mix uh, skewed to Japan, Asia, and uh, largely you know, North America. So uh, a high uh, ZEB regulated market like uh, Europe, China, and uh, maybe future in North America, uh, they are targeting 40 to 50%. So uh, Japan OEMs is also prepared well to meet with this target for uh, necessary markets. Now, if you move to the next slide, page seven, uh, I think that this is an example of Volkswagen, which is uh, probably running uh, a top runner in a, a, a global strategies. And uh, Volkswagen is targeting 50% uh, by 2030, uh, which is higher uh, than Japanese OEMs, but uh, their sales mix are very, very much different more than 80% of revenue is coming from Europe and China. So the differences are largely caused by those country mix. And uh, I do not think there is no huge difference in uh, essential target to meet the emission target by 2030. If you go to the next slide, page seven, uh, this is Ford strategy. And uh, Ford is also uh, announced a long weighted strategy and uh, they are targeting about 40% by 2030. Um, so um, uh, I think uh, looking over, you know, making those kind of a strategy announcement, uh, what I found three key common uh, 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 pillars of their strategies. Uh, number one, they are trying to prepare a scalable EV purpose-built platform 
Mm -hmm. uh, please go to page seven. I think uh, you can see uh, Ford uh, scalable Zebra platform. And um, uh, uh, this is a closed architecture and uh, 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 looking for a high scalability uh, uh, that's produced in-house by OEM. So even uh, uh, vehicle is moving from ICE to battery EV, the closed architecture in-house developed platform basically no change. So I do not believe there is no uh, significant change of uh, uh, industry structure, uh, which is uh, common in ICE, but uh, that's continuing to battery EV age. Mm -hmm. And uh, number two, uh, a vertical integrating battery technologies. Uh, it, we used to think of batteries are buying simply from battery manufacturers, but, but that's very important to change is happening. Cell are designed by OEM and they also start to produce in-house. Uh, if you come to next slide, page eight, uh, you can see this scale of uh, uh, battery manufacturing by OEMs, like a 240 giga Volkswagen, 60 giga by Stellantis, and even Toyota are targeted to produce 180 giga by 2030. Yeah. So vertically integrating battery technologies. And OEMs are moving into more vertically integrated, including software, uh, uh, semiconductors, and uh, batteries, uh, e-drive e trains. So it's not a simple diversification. I think uh, you know, the sector continue to stay in a vertical integrated. And uh, lastly, very important thing is as Mr. Shu has uh, you know, uh, explained, the industry is not just replacing the ice with a uh, uh, battery and a motor. The industry is uh, changing to software fast. Mm -hmm. Uh, battery EV is based on a software fast platform, mm -hmm. and uh, that is a, a critically important thing. You know, addressable market of automobiles is changing. Uh, uh, that is used to be only automobile, but that is expanding to smart home, smart city, and a smart mobility. Uh, that is a uh, you know uh, uh, the the market is expanding. So OEM strategy is a pretty similar, and I don't think there is no huge differences, but. Uh, Volkswagen has a significant need to do its earlier than Toyota because of the you know, change difference of uh, country mix. But eventually by 2035, everybody really need to focus on more Zeb sales uh, uh, than 2030's target. Great, thank you very much. And if you could switch the slide to the next, place, uh, next page, just to get this, this is the one that Nakanishi-san was talking about earlier. Um, and you could kind of look at um, the different strategies by, by the OEMs in Europe and US and, and Japan. Um, now, So-san, um, uh, so Nakanishi-san has been talking about US market and European market, and obviously Chinese market, which is, the, which is already the largest um, of any automobile market in the world. Right. It's one of the leading um, market, market in, the, in the electronic vehicles. Now, could you um, sort of explain us briefly um, what the situation in the Chinese EV sales trend, um, compa especially compared from the European uh, uh, market? And if you could switch to uh, Sosan's slide, that'll be great. I think it's slide. Um, maybe not next, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah next, yeah, right. It's a title. And can we move to, right, great. Yeah. Uh, so also, uh, Nagarisa also, mentioned the software uh, defined vehicles. And uh, actually later, I would like to introduce the software defined vehicles in detail. But now uh, I should, uh, first of all, I should ask, ask Akito's question about the China, uh, the current uh, market in situation. So here's the ranking of EV models by sales volume in China in the first, hour, uh, first half of this year. Surprising, most of the 15 top selling models are made by Chinese traditional and emerging automakers. The top seller, which leads by a huge margin, is Wuning Mini EV, a two door, four seat, micro size EV, which seems to be also widely known in Japan. As for foreign automakers, there are only three models which made the list two Tesla models in the second and the fifth place and the BMW iX3 in the 12th place. The result is largely due to the IMD and the sales strategy of Chinese traditional and emerging automakers that accurately captures the characteristics of Chinese consumers. I would also like to explain the details on the next page. Can we move to the next? 
So here are two charts, uh, the left side and the right side, to compare the first half of this year's best selling EV models in European market and with their counterparts in Chinese market. Take German automakers, for example, three of the top 10 EVs in EU are German. Why none of the German the best selling German EVs are only found in the 12th, 32nd, and 34th place. So this is a very interesting phenomenon. These two charts also show that the large automakers like BMW and Volkswagen may achieve success in one market, but not necessarily in another market. So can we also move to the next slide? I want to yeah, explain the detail. Great. I'd like to compare the Chinese and the European EV market. There are two main reasons why foreign automakers, which are performing well in Europe, but they are struggling in China. The first is a competitive environment. A large number of automakers of more affordable EV models in China. So making the market very competitive for foreign players who tend to offer EVs in the luxury se segment window. In Chinese EV market, over 140 models are sold in the, around the 70 brands. In contrast, in Europe, around 60 models are offered by about 30 brands. The second and the more important point is how to sell them. From the age of gasoline vehicles, primary touch point with customers has been the dealership. However, Chinese automakers, such as Neo Expen and Liot, so the travel we call We Shall Be, if our language is Chinese, so We Shall Be is very popular in China now, have chosen to connect directly with their customers. They connect with customers via SMS like Weibo and quickly reflect customer feedbacks on vehicles through OTA updates. This improves customer satisfaction greatly. As a result, domestic models are more popular compared to foreign ones, even with, within the same price range. So it's a very important thing. In response to this situation, foreign automakers are also attempting similar sales strategies acquired from their Chinese competitors. Yeah. Very interesting, very interesting. Nakanisan, quickly, um, what do you think uh, will happen to global OEMs in Chinese EV market? And another question is, will um, Chinese EV manufacturers, would they succeed globally, Nakanishi-san? What do you think? Okay, uh, I have been uh, what, you know, monitoring the you know, sales performance of global OEM products in Chinese market. And uh, I have uh, exactly the same feeling about uh, Mr. Xu mentioned. Global OEMs are so struggling uh, mm. selling uh, battery EV in Chinese market, yeah. Yeah. which is probably I think uh, you know a big wave of uh, uh, battery EV sales in China has a somewhat a different characteristic from the global sales trend, and uh, uh, I just have a uh, you know, feeling that uh, selling battery EV is not easy, and um, uh, they really need to change the business model essentially. So that is the reason why. This is not a, just a simple game of replacing ice to motor and a battery. This is a really game from the hardware to software. And uh, uh, the battery EV can create a new connected value. Uh, that is uh, appealing new to the customer's reason to own a battery EV. So economically speaking, a battery EV stay difficult in sales probably until 2030. And a government really need to subsidize the cost of a battery EV. That's going to be really expensive. So uh, this is not an easy changing game. That's what I'm feeling about uh, today's sales struggle of global OEMs product in China. And uh, your second question, uh, uh, particularly good example is Neo, mm. probably continue to do well in China, but uh, I doubt about uh, their competitiveness in the global market uh, because of the availability of uh, data or uh, uh, customer connectivity are uh, uh, very different for Neo enjoy in China. And uh, the struggle probably have in outside the China Chinese market. Great the relationships between the customer and the OEM uh, through connectivity and a software-driven business. That is an important trigger 
uh, really drive the sales of the Bachiri EV. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And, and Sosan, I would like to ask about the battery situation in China. Um, Chinese company has very strong footage on the battery production. Could you briefly explain about what's happening in the, in the Chinese battery business? Uh, um, and, and if we could go back to Sosan's slide, please. I think it's uh, slide number... Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's not... It's a, no, this side, I'm, yeah, I try to introduce the China emerging makers, their sales approach, very unique method. Message. I think for battery, maybe the next and uh, next. Yeah, yeah, I think we, we can. Could we uh, skip the slide? Uh, next slide, please. Again, one uh, more. Uh, it's also not this side. Uh, yeah, maybe this. But I also would like to introduce some unique message if possible. Mm -hmm. Can I? Yeah. But for battery, no, let, let's move to the battery. It's OK, of course. Yeah, here. So, so let's first take a look at the chart on the left. So which is the volume of battery packs deployed in China by packs price between January and July this, this year also? The market of EV battery in China is concentrated as the top three companies, CLPR, Ninde Style, BYD, and LG Chem is a Korea company, take up 72% of the total market share. And the top five companies occupy 84% shares. Domestic battery pack suppliers such as CTR and BYD have gained a very high market share due to the rapid growth of the China EV market. So the chart on the right shows the volume of battery packs in China deployed by cathode material for the same period. So RFP so, and the MMC are the most popular types of cathode metals in China due to the low cost Long life cycle and the very high safety level of RFP, it tends to be adopted more widely than MMC, which is difficult to procure due to the high price of cobalt and nickel. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's now the current situation now for battery market and the battery materials. Yeah. So also, okay. yeah, if. Yeah. Do you uh, have any comments, Nakani-san? Yeah, Nakani-san, it's the latest. Sorry, I was uh, reading question list. Uh, so what are the question to me? Nakani-san, do you have any comments about the battery production in China? Uh, uh, sorry, I, I was not listening. No, that's okay, that's okay. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's switch on, let's switch on, no problem. Yeah. So, um, uh, I think definitely the, the in China, the battery player, players become very concentrated. It's also, I think, not only in China, but also maybe in the future, in US and in European market, also in Japan market, Japan's market, the same situation will be will happen because you know, we know the battery introduction will really, it's huge investment, yeah. yeah. Yes. But anyhow, in a trend I observe uh, from OEM side of uh, intention is uh, uh, cell designing. Uh, right. OEM have to be doing in-house mm -hmm. together with the uh, battery manufacturers. And uh, that is a necessary technology to improve uh, uh, battery efficiency mm -hmm. uh, or uh, reducing cost of uh, battery EV. I so uh, uh, I think OEM is willing to take a more uh, uh, vertical integration, direct investment into battery cell designing and manufacturing. And uh, uh, I think uh, you know, uh, Chinese and uh, Korean OE, uh, uh, battery manufacturers will take uh, you know, significant investment to manufacture the uh, cells and uh, uh, packaging. Uh, so that, that is, uh, you know, I think, a uh, you know, trend we see from the OEM side. Great, interesting. Um, one sort of big picture question. Um, obviously, if you look at technologies like information technologies or internet, semiconductor, we are seeing a, a huge divide between the, the US and China. And this is primarily political reasons. Now, do we have to worry about this issue in the EV batteries in the future? Meaning, would some point, um, could Biden administration or administration following Biden might ban import um, of, a, of a raw metal or vice versa. Maybe China will say we're not gonna import, uh, export raw metals to US or maybe not to Europe, but to US. Shall we worry about this great 
tech divide coming into the, the EV market. Uh, first, Nakanishi-san. Yes, I do worry about the political dispute uh, which affect on the uh, uh, battery uh, side of the procurement. But anyhow, Europe and the US, they are biased to local production for local consumption, especially implementing border uh, carbon border adjustment for European policy. And the US is uh, spending a huge subsidy, you know, Japan, uh, go, go national budget uh, to subsidize you know, local production. So batteries are, uh, not a, you know, a global export products. I think uh, you know, battery and a battery EV uh, become an industrial product, which is a, a locally, produ locally produced and a locally consumed. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so I think a production is a divided. The question is the supply of the raw materials. I think access to rare metal or uh, earth, you know, uh, rare earth elements, uh, that should have a certain concern for uh, sustainability of the procurement. So uh, I, I think that that's going to be a future dispute. And uh, now is a kind of a competition to contract a future supply of uh, uh, raw me rare metals and, uh, and rare, rare earth in order to sustain a, a volume and scalable expansion over battery production. Very interesting. So, San, what do you think? Um, Will there be an effect uh, US-China conflict to the battery EV market in the future? Well, oh, it's difficult to answer for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think uh, for battery supply chain, it's, it's a big topic so for, for major EV market and then for major EV players, so yeah. I see, great, thank you. Um, I think we have some more slides from Tosan. Could, you, could we switch to Tosan's uh, slide, please? Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about batteries. What are the what are the challenges and what are the future sort of development um, going on in the in the in the battery market? I think it will be next slide. Right, right. Yeah, let's move to the. I think yeah, this slide is okay. Yeah, here. So, as we have seen, the market is very concentrated. I mentioned with this chance, Here are three key points that should be valued in the future. First, let's look at the structure of EV industry. As a battery industry is governed by economy of scale. The market concentration of the top companies will also push them to grow rapidly worldwide. In addition, while demand is growing rapidly, raw materials are demand limited. So uh, Nakane-san and uh, Akutsu-san, you mentioned. So therefore, it's very important to, to ensure access to materials and to utilize reused and recycled products. As a result, from the perspective of battery consumer company, for example, OEMs and other the battery consumer companies, it's better to directly control the supply chain and the product recycling. Lastly, the economic system built up by battery will play a greater role in the future. So it's possible the, that large ex ecosystem will be constructed around the batteries, similar to the, our now current automotive industry. Mm -hmm. So the chance above not only apply to China, but also the global ma market. Yeah, I think. Great, great, thank you. Um, and sort of again, back to big uh, fundamental futuristic uh, questions. Um, Nakanishi-san, when we talk about transition to EV, the traditional OEM says this is a once in a century problem or challenge. Um, we require a lot of investments. It's really tough to make those transitions. And it seems that it kind of has a negative impact within the OEM sector. Now let's look at the bright side. What, are the, what do you think is the new opportunity and who might capture these opportunities? Even in the OEM, what are the bright side that we can look into uh, in the, the transition into the EV? Yes, uh, maybe we are focusing too much on the dark side. Actually, there are plenty of uh, you know a bright side. Let's move on to my slide, uh, page. Uh, let me see. Yes, uh, page ten. Can we show Nakanishi-san's slide, please? Yes, uh, Amy. For this is an example of uh, Volkswagen, and Volkswagen is uh, one of the leader, you know, standardizing uh, uh, ICE technologies. Uh, such as introducing a platform like uh, MQB for volume range and uh, MLB for premium and spot range. And uh, now they are trying to replace uh, this platform with uh, uh, MEB for volume and a PPE for uh, 
uh, uh, premium, but uh, they are targeting to standardize only one battery EV platform, so-called SSP. And uh, that's targeted by 2025 when uh, uh, Volkswagen OS version 2.0 is available. This is a completely decoupling software and hardware and a software control function of the hardware. And uh, uh, this is a really increasing huge level of standardization uh, simplification. Uh, so uh, uh, the OEM is benefited from this high scalability standardization and simplification and does not have to invest into complicated ICE technologies. Huge saving coming from not investing into ICE technologies anymore and a high level of volume scalability and standardization. And uh, this will create you know, the, the, the vehicle OS is something like uh, Android OS in a cell phone, and uh, which has a connectivity uh, to smart home, smart city, and a smart mobility that expands significantly the uh, size of their addressable market. Uh, Volkswagen estimates today's their addressable market is only 2 trillion euro. They expect to expand by 5 trillion euro uh, by 2030. So uh, move to coming to page 11. Uh, this actually I summarize a trend of uh, 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 impact on manufacturing uh, due to the uh, battery EV shift. Uh, there, are, of course, uh, you know, change in um, uh, components. So that creates a lot of opportunity for new components manufacturers. Uh, at the same time, high standardization, scalability, and simplicity benefit OEM to focus on a more profitable business and also expand their uh, value chain. And uh, uh, also uh, 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 the hardware, there is a new requirement of which accept the evolution of the software. But anyhow, there are three rising powers. I think a personally owned vehicle, major OEM continue to control in-house developed uh, closed architecture skateboard type of platform. Maybe probably 85 to 90% of the car vehicle sales are still controlled by global OEMs. But at the same time, uh, there is a, 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 a scalable provider like a Magna or Rivian, and also open architecture, a scalable processor manufacturer like a Foxon or a Lee. That's kind of a new uh, emerging company. It's also opportunity starting from mass vehicle, but uh, taking uh, some percentage uh, components share uh, in the future. But uh, anyhow, this is an expanding market size and uh, that is uh, feeding enough to you know, existing uh, uh, OEM uh, manufacturer and components manufacturers. But a key point, key important point is how they can achieve capability to deal with a software first uh, new business model. That transition is a very important thing to uh, really pursued by uh, uh, OEM remain competitiveness. Very, very, very interesting. Now on this three rising powers, this was not in our previous um, question that I provided you, so it's gonna be a surprise one. Um, who would use platforms of either Foxconn or Magna? Could it be companies like Apple or what are the, who are the, who's gonna be the customer of these Foxconn and Magna? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, the OEM uh, probably continue to focus on their in-house developed uh, uh, purpose-built EV platforms. Majority will be built on their in-house platform. But a uh, newcomers, uh, like emerging companies or uh, IT companies uh, uh, definitely start to utilize uh, uh, open architecture platform. But uh, the availability of that technology is uh, probably still a decade away. Mm -hmm. uh, and interesting point is uh, 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 the, the, the uh, foundry type of the you know, business will probably start to emerge. And uh, that is, uh, you know, a Foxconn or a Magna probably can, you know, act as for foundry, uh, just a production uh, uh, outsourcing uh, from OEM. But uh, that architecture is uh, still controlled by in-house and a closed architecture by OEM. That's kind of a scenario I expect. So right. that's not gonna be a simple uh, uh, open diversification. I think uh, OEM continue to stay in a, a closed architecture and a vertically integrated, uh, but uh, there is an open area, especially for assembly side. I see, interesting. Uh, Thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, oh, so can I add some comments about the platform? Yeah. I also, yeah, you mentioned maybe Foxconn and the Uri. Uh, also, uh, you can find in China, Chinese automotive market, 
So we can also find, I think, GD, they have a joint venture with Baidu. Uh, so the joint venture's name is uh, Jidu, the name. So I think the, the new company and the new tech com company, the emerging aut automotive makers, so they will use the traditional OEMs platform. So also Nakanishi maybe for automotive, traditional automotive makers, the larger, they will keep their just uh, uh, architecture very closely, I think, but uh, maybe just for some new emerging automotive make makers, if they also develop their architecture, they develop their platform, I think maybe in the future, they will compete with uh, traditional automotive makers, yeah. Very interesting. If we could show um, Sosan's slide, yeah. and I'm not sure which number it is. It's, it's well, which question, so we, we can find. Could you could you, uh, Foxconn. could you look at the slide and then go to the slide that says Foxconn offers unique product lineup? Okay, I think the last, yeah. Uh, one more? Uh, one more, yeah, yeah. One, more, one more. One more, yeah. One more, yeah. And the next. Next one. I, I'm remembering my size very well. Next, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Please, please, please. Could you explain this one? I think this oh, is quite interesting. Yeah, of course, yeah. So let's, let's take a look at Foxconn as a case study. So it has made several moves towards partnership or investments on many parts of EV supply chain. In terms of semiconductors, it bought one facility from Mechanix, a purchase that would help Foxconn secure a steady supply of auto chips like silicon carbide. Mm. In the area of EV motor, Foxconn is seeking a JV with Nikon Denson, NIDEC, a Japan's electric motor manufacturer. In the field of digital cockpit, it established a JV called Mobile Drive with Stenantis, a merger of PSA and FCA. This JV focuses on software development. Besides, it's also made several moves towards EV battery. After collaborating with CATR, it also invested in battery material added. So Foxconn also established a JV with GD, Yunong, and the Thai state-owned company, PTT, to promote body production. So I mentioned that GD also established a JV with Baidu. So now it's, it's not, uh, you mean, when traditional automotives, they can collaborate with emerging, several emerging make players. So Foxconn has also partnered with US EV startup, Fisker, to jointly develop and manufacture and the Fisker brand. So we will see more and more integration of electrical and electronics know-how into automotive industry. So collaborations like this can help traditional OEMs, larger OEMs, reduce productive development cycle and achieve greater competitiveness in this new EV era. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Um, now, I would like to take uh, some questions from the audience. Um, and the questions that we are getting quite a lot is about the, the chip shortage, obviously, because that's one of the, so the, the semiconductor shortage, because that's one of the, the biggest problems right now in the auto market. Now, Nakanishi-san, as, as an analyst, how do you view uh, a current chip crisis? Um, how, how would it affect EV productions and development and research and development and stuff like this? Should we be seriously worried or is this only one thing and then it, you know, it's gonna go on off at some point, we don't really have to worry about it. What's your take on this? Well, uh, I do not think there is uh, any serious damage uh, for future uh, battery EV designing and production due to today's mm -hmm. structural shortage of you know, uh, sem semiconductor chips. I think that will be solved uh, by as early as uh, January to March quarter next year. Okay. And uh, also uh, Asian supply chain issue, uh, ma mainly in Malaysia, uh, like I still micro, you know, uh, that would be also uh, uh, back to normal sooner or later. So okay. the issue for semiconductor for a uh, future battery EV and today's shortage of uh, uh, semiconductor are different story, different issue. Okay. I do believe semiconductor continue to be very important part of uh, automotive core technologies. 
and uh, OEM want to be in charge of their in-house and also you know, uh, secure uh, procurement. And uh, government also want to secure the industry inside their own country, US, Europe, and Japan. And uh, that you know, uh, a competition and a supply chain issue probably become a key important you know, judgment for uh, competitiveness of battery EV in the future. Because battery EV is not just uh, like uh, uh, replacing engines with uh, uh, motors. That is uh, really making this industry to uh, you know, data and uh, communication. And uh, that is uh, based on cheap performance. Mm. Uh, so that is a very important you know, discussion in the future. But uh, today's shortage, it's just a structural supply shortage imbalance, and that will be solved sooner or later. But U.S. tried to build more in, Japan, in the U.S. Japan tried to build more in Japan, and that kind of a, you know, a power, power fight for a semiconductor will become a key important competitiveness of battery EV business in the future. So issues are different. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, uh, Akito-san, can okay. also I add some comments about chip? Yeah. I think that just, yeah, now the shortage, we, may, we mentioned the chips. So many power electronics chips, I think it's, a, it's a mainly shortage. But we also, I think chip will be become more and more very, very important parts. Especially let's imagine the connectivity and especially autonomous driving. Mm. So the chip will become, especially just that way, perception, AI, so it will be integrated into chips. Mm -hmm. So now the big discussion, the chip will be designed by OEMs or will be designed AI companies or will be designed by tier one. So I think it's maybe in the next 10 years or five years. So I guess we now level two, level three, level five. So the car will become very, very smart and then, and very, very smart and connectivity. Mm -hmm. So it is then lots of information, not only battery, but also lots of perception, surrounding information will be handled, will be implemented. So at that time, we think, I think the chip will be on the not just an infotainment chip, will be on the concept of elect, power electrics, electronics. So the chip will, the concept will become the of a cast brain computer. Yeah. So then I think maybe not only the shortage concept, but also the very, very so cheap who will design, who will dominate this territory. Yes, yeah. that's, a, that's a very important point, especially when we talk about the autonomous vehicle. Unfortunately, we kind of had to skip that part because we're talking about EVs today. But yeah. I mean, if you could el elaborate on that comment by Tsosan, um, when you look for, uh, into the future in autonomous vehicle, there's always a discussion who will be the controller of those autonomous vehicle and the chips, as, as Sosan said, you know, would, are these companies like Google okay. right. And, right. and those guys, and then the um, OEMs, which is the auto manufacturer, they'll only be making a hardware, which right. will be controlled by all these right. service providers. Wait. What do you think, yeah. Maybe Sosan first, yeah. Yeah, great question, great question. I think just now, uh, lots of special huge OEM. They also now understand. They are understanding the chip will be very very important mm -hmm. for themselves. But till now, but for huge automotive play, uh, players, they prefer to ask a tier one or maybe chip uh, designer to design chippers. Mm -hmm. But also we can look at some emerging makers. Mm -hmm. For example, Tesla or maybe just a cruise or maybe Wemo. Mm -hmm. So because they are very strong at they are very strong at their AI. Mm -hmm. um, they are strong uh, very strong at their big goal at their computer vision, machining, deep learning. So they have capability to design their chip. Mm -hmm. So also we can find just in mobile industry. So usually Qualcomm they design by chip. So mobile uh, with uh, mobile players, so they would like to buy chips for Qualcomm. But gradually we also find that Apple, now they are designing. So it's, I think it's the same reason. But maybe now just some emerging IT players, so they were design maybe autonomous chips by themselves. But I also think if the market will become very, very big, 
So huge automotive makers, they will think when where they design ship. I think it's a, it's a very, very critical decision point for themselves. Interesting. And Nakanishi-san, this is probably a question you've been asked a millions of times. What do you think? Do you think the OEM can control their own destiny in the autonomous vehicle? Or will they eventually be controlled by the, the big IT companies in the US or in China? Well, there are differences in evolution in AD technologies for mass vehicles and uh, uh, POV, personally owned vehicles. So uh, it's hard to answer your question. It's actually answer different depend on two different area. But seems like a POV evolution, you know, from level two to level three and eventually going to level four, it takes a quite long time uh, to evolve, evolute. Uh, to uh, uh, high level of uh, uh, autonomous driving. Mm. So uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not a simple open architecture, you know, uh, game, you know, prepared by Google or, uh, you know, uh, uh, other IT companies, you know. So uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, OEM still have a great chance to empower controlling uh, AD technologies for POV, POV side. Mm. And a uh, mass vehicles are very much different because, uh, uh, a robot taxi, that kind of, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the development uh, uh, far advanced uh, for Google and also cruise, you know, that's owned by GM, but uh, uh, that's also, you know, uh, uh, taking a fairly high level of leadership. So uh, I think our OEM will collaborate with uh, emerging IT companies for mass side and I try to be their in-house technology for POV side. And uh, in fact, Apple, I heard, they're preparing to entering into automotive industry, but I don't see any evidence of uh, they are ready now uh, because their business model have to be combined with uh, EV and AD. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, those two technologies are not available yet. And uh, uh, it is uh, still high hurdle to enter this industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's not something like, uh, you know, uh, uh, easy open architecture type of, uh, you know, uh, a change of the industry. Uh, it's a separated mass, mass side of the market. Uh, POB still, I think OEM continue to take in a uh, leadership uh, controlling that technologies. Very interesting. Now, just for the audience sake, POV refers to personally owned vehicle. So it's basically a vehicle that people buy for, for their own use. So it's, it, it's just a regular car, usually, basically. Yes. And when you say mass, it's a, uh, it's a mobility, mobility as a service. And the, uh, the hardware, which is a robotaxi, as Nakanishi mentioned, will be owned by some service provider right. and um so this, this is a rather you know uh, tanaka -san, you know your question is uh, probably almost the same as uh, percentage of split of uh, mass buses to pov ah, true, true. and i basically believe by 2030 90 to 85 percent of the market is still pov the right. mass is emerging but only 10 percent or maybe up to 15 percent so uh, it's a two separated market and uh, it's not something replacing you know in eventually in the future they will emerge uh, beyond the singularity, but uh, uh, it takes a really long time to make a, such a judgment day. That's very true. Yeah. Um, uh, go uh, ahead, Tosan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's a it's really very hot topic. I think the competition, especially, I think, uh, Napensa mentioned, uh, especially in POV and uh, mass. I think the POV mainly focus on the level 2.x. So we can find some very huge OEMs. For example, Volkswagen. So this, I think this year, this set of a uh, software company is called Caviar. So also we think in Japan, uh, Toyota, they set up uh, so also soft, similar software company, Uwen. So they have main purpose for what? Strengthen their software capability. I think maybe most of the, the resources, they will focus and aim for POV, for passenger vehicle. Yeah, but also I think in the future, but we cannot imagine maybe 10 years later, level four and the level 2.x, it will be integrated in the future, I think. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, as, as you can see, this is one of the most, most interesting topic in the, in the business environment right now. Right. And if we put a, a expert like Nakanishi-san and So-san in the discussion, we, we can keep on discussing this for another three hours. But unfortunately, <laughs> our times are coming to the end. Um, if just, just for the sake of our readers, uh, which we have a lot of um, 
readers from Southeast Asia. Um, if you have any, do you have any uh, comments about the outlook on the Southeast Asia uh, uh, EV hybrid? Nakanisan mentioned maybe it might be a hybrid for a while. Uh, Nakanisan, first, do you have any comments about the Southeast Asian market, EV, EV electrification market? Well, I think that they are also uh, strive to increase EV penetration, uh, but are not as high as uh, developed market like uh, Europe and the uh, US because of a difference of availability of green energy. So I think their path to carbon neutrality are not the same as uh, European driven carbon neutrality. And uh, there are diversity and also different strategy to cope with the carbon neutrality. So uh, uh, by 2030, maybe uh, 10, 20 or 25 percent of uh, zero emission vehicle is possible, but uh, not as high as a developed market. So I think uh, you know current ICE and hybrid technology probably have a little longer tail uh, business horizon uh, in Southeast Asia, in my view. Yeah. Very interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, can I also? I think uh, South Southeast Asia market is very attractive. Also, so let's imagine. Uh, I mentioned Wudin. It's also it's also very low in China uh, in Japan now, so it's, I think the price range is very very important mm. for especially if we want to make a big volume in Southeast Asia. So how to tailor Southeast Asia consumers' needs really I think it's very important. You cannot just set a very very expensive price price goal so into the luxury segment. Maybe I think it's not impossible, but I think for the suitable, available, affordable price range, it's very important. Yeah. Do you think the Chinese um, EV manufacturers have chance to entering Southeast Asian market? I, I, you, uh, you always mention, uh, ask me, ask a question, uh, sharp questions. I think that just not only Chinese EV players, but also Japanese. Also, we mentioned, I mentioned the Foxconn. They set a joint venture with PTT Thailand. I think it's a mere, uh, not only the Chinese, but also Japanese and also Korean company, automotive companies. They will go there. They will uh, expand this new product lineup, especially in EV segment, I think. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much both for joining. It's been a, it's been a very interesting conversation. And I hope uh, our audience liked it as well. Um, we are getting a lot a lot of questions about the slide deck that you both shared with us, but I believe these are not for download or for public available. Um, do you have any comment if, if you wanted uh, to, if, the, if the audience wanted to know about these, uh, these insights, what should they do? Uh, so son first? I think that they can maybe mirror me. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to ask them questions. Yeah. You might receive hundreds of emails, but- um... yeah, yeah, here is my, yeah. Leitsu, okay. Shulai. So Nakaisa call me Shu because it's my Japanese pronunciation. My yeah. Chinese pronunciation is Zhou, yeah. So and you can- Nakanisan, what shall, what shall the audience do if they wanted more insights from you? Uh, well, yeah, just uh, email to me uh, okay. in English, please. And mm -hmm. um, uh, I try to make uh, my slide set available as much as possible. Uh, so okay. let's discuss uh, Tanaka-san later, how we Thank do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, both. Always a big, big we help. We have about 100 questions. <laughs> yeah, lots of questions. <laughs> we have over 800 participants. Um, I hope it was an enjoyable, enjoyable um, event. And special thanks to both Nakanishi-san and Sosan. And hopefully we can meet again uh, next time with a bit more preparation time so we can discuss about broad issues. Um, so please come again. Um, and so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Yes. Sosan, yeah, nice, nice, nice discussion with you. <laughs> yeah, Nakanishi-san. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, unfortunately, we can't go out for a drink after this because of the pandemic, but we'll do that <laughs> once once as possible. Well, um, I, I think by myself. I think definitely when they will come. Yes. Physical. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>